In the previous lecture, we discussed flows in some detail. Now I would like to explain how you reduce a flow to a map. That map is called Poincaré section. Imagine that you have your dynamical system in a state space. So here is our state space M. And within it, there is a trajectory. Now we construct a hypersurface. Let's call it P for Poincaré, whose dimension is co-dimension one. What that means is that if the state space is three-dimensional, as we are visualizing it now, this is just a two-dimensional surface. If state space is 27-dimensional, this is a 26-dimensional hypersurface, which is hard for us to visualize, but no problem implementing as computation. And this surface has to be designed in such a way that it cuts the jumble of our spaghetti that fill out the state space, the orbits. It cuts them transversely. So here I've taken a periodic orbit, and you notice that this periodic orbit is cuts that surface once here at point one, then it goes around, tuk, 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 cuts it again, and then it goes around and, you know, goes behind and cuts it again. And then it cuts it again, but in wrong direction. So Poincaré section is not only that it's a hypersurface that the orbit should cut transversely, but it should cut it in the same direction every time. If it cuts in the opposite direction, as you'll see, this is not a natural thing because you're trying to describe with a Poincaré section a whole neighborhood of orbits, just like yours, but slightly off from your orbit. So that's a Poincaré section. One thing you have to understand about Poincaré section, it is not a projection. So what we mean by projection, it's not a projection onto lower dimensional state space. When you take a Poincaré section, you don't lose any information about the system. All you're doing is you're changing your coordinates in such a way that one coordinate, the one that went out of you know, this one is one of the coordinates. Uh, that goes out of Poincaré section. It's called a longitudinal coordinate and rests at transverse. If you want to find any point on the orbit, you can just start at the section and integrate to it. So you haven't lost any information by going this way. So, you can always reconstruct your trajectory, but the new coordinates are much smarter than the original ones, as you will see. So more precisely, a Poincaré section is a hypersurface that can be specified implicitly by any functions. <clears throat> so if I set a condition that some function is zero whenever I cross the section, I impose one condition on the system, so it reduce the dimensionality of the space on one. That's how we get co-dimension one surface. And we have to make sure that it's transverse. So at that point, the tangent to our curve is this velocity vector. The gradient of the hypersurface, if you don't know about it, <clears throat> learn about it, but the gradient of the hypersurface is something of this condition, is something that's zero in the surface itself because condition remains zero, but it's non-zero going out, and it's actually a vector which is normal to the surface. So we have some notion of a dot product in this space, not entirely obvious, but imagine it's Euclidean space or state space. Then the dot product times the W should not be zero, then we know that we are cutting through and not being within the section. And in this way, the continuous time flow is reduced 
to a sequence of oriented traversals, I guarantee oriented by making sure that this is, for example, just positive or negative, that these are all crossings have the same sign. Here is an example for Lorentz. As you will discover, Poincaré sections are dark art, you know, partially aesthetic, partially some intuition about the flow. There are sort of some thumb rules how you should construct them, but uh, it's not obvious ever when you work in a particular system. So here I'll give two examples of section that might make sense to you. One of them is a Lorentz flow, as you remember, is, was a flow in which there was some motion like this, and then every so often that motion flips on the other side. So a section, the motion is around the equilibrium point, as we showed last time. So a natural way to choose hyperplane is to make sure that it goes through equilibria. In this way, at least neighborhoods of equilibria will be nicely cut. And in this particular case, it's convenient to make the plane, in this case, not some curved hypersurface, just a plane. It's convenient to make it such that the section goes through the z-axis. It'll turn out that's an invariant axis of the symmetry of this problem. And so we have a surface. And now what this surface does, it cuts in uh, in oriented way, the flow. So what you see here is you see bits of the flow which are toward us and they're made gray. They are made gray whenever they get behind the plane and then they do their thing, they come out or jump down and then they come out here, etc. And as a result, you have a bunch of points which are oriented crossings. Now, pretty soon you realize there is no point of doing this twice because of the symmetry. It's good enough to just take half of the hyperplane. That's indicated here. So this is our first Poincaré section P. And now when we look at the crossing, you see the flow looks much simpler. It's just a smooth line with dots lying on a line as far as we can tell. Or uh, you might say, well, you know, this is not so interesting to me because I would like to understand jumps. You know, this one was focused on equilibria. You know, this Poincaré section had to do with equilibria. Equilibrium. Uh, so let me take another Poincaré section. This is P1 which keeps track of how I jump from this side to the other side. So this is our Poincaré section P2, and I've laid her here on the side, or actually Evangelo Simenos who draw this picture. And uh, this, you know, is a different section of the flow, but topologically looks similar. So that's a very simple example of a Poincaré section. And I hope you will implement this by doing the problem set. Another example which we'll often use in this course is the example of Rosler strange attractor. And in that case, we'll do the same as I just showed you in Lorentz. So what we'll do is we will take a plane, half plane, that goes through here, goes through this equilibrium point, and the section of the flow is this line, for example. So this is our Poincaré section A. So you can visualize this plane here, tuk, 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 tuk. And this is where the flow pierces it going through. Uh, it looks rather boring, but uh, okay you'll find out that that's actually extremely good Poincaré section. Now, you have a great deal of choice how you do the sections, so let's turn it by 90 degrees, and that will be this other section here that you see. I don't want to do that. This other section, 
let's call it Poincaré section B, so hyperplane going at 90 degrees away from us. This is kind of interesting what has happened to the floor. This line has stretched and become bigger. Uh, then we turn our plane by another 45 degrees or so. That's the plane C, this one. And, uh, you know, when we look at it, the thing has started folding. Then we go to the plane, this one, Poincaré section D, this one. An interesting thing happens, the thing gets pinched. And uh, unfortunately, the scale is gone from this figure. It should be on the right hand side. It turns out that as we go further, this gets very, very thin in the units of this figure, which was of order 20. This gets to be very small. And uh, by the time we get back, we'll find out that the thickness of this is 10 to the minus 14. I'll explain why. And to see the orientations of the section, we also gave you another picture from above, this picture here. So what we learned from this is the essence of chaos from this very simple example, and that's why Rosler designed a simple example. What we learn is that the line segment, AB, so this line segment, Uh, which starts close to the xy plane in the beginning. It gets stretched and folded, so it does something like that. So we find out that low flow is locally expanding. But then this folding is followed by being bent And so here you're being bent, and then you're being scrunched down here. In this one, bent, and then you're being pushed down into the plane again. So uh, the thing that used to be a straight line has been folded onto itself. And there are three kinds of points on this straight line. There are two edges. So these two edges, Let's call them A and B. A and B. A and B. What happens now, A lands here and B lands there. And once you're done, you realize there's another point, which we'll call turn back. turn back C, and this one becomes the new edge. So what used to be B is now the new edge. So the flow is stretching, and then it's mixing, because what used to be on the edge is now plump in the middle of the thing. And what chaos does is it takes the interval, folds it onto itself, does it again, folds it onto itself, Mathematicians like to call this kneading. It's a very natural operation of, that you do in doing Danish pastry. For example, I did it on a science program for Danish television. I went to Danish baker Iverson and we did Danish pastry in the same mixing. And what you find out if you do some estimates, uh, after maybe 12 of this mixing, the things are already mixed on levels of molecules. Of, so if you had something that was white and red in the beginning, you get pink uh, dough very quickly. So kneading is very effective. So that's what chaos does. Nearby things separate, and uh, far away things actually get very close by ergodic motions on a strange attractor. So what we learned from the section was something that it was very hard to visualize from the full flow. What we learn is that what's important is transverse dynamics. You know, we were whirling around, and that was pretty uninteresting. But what was going in the transverse direction, that was very interesting. So dynamics along the orbits, you know, has some role, but it's not actually very important. And that's the real essence of Poincaré section. 
it isolates important stuff, which is how your neighbors go away from you or approach you, while you all march together in a, along the floor, along your spaghetti, and that's less interesting. So that now means that we started with differential equations, Newton's equations or Rosler's or Lorentz or somebody's equations. And we have reduced them to a return map. See, we can compute this map for any point. So we start at point x1, then we go from return time, tx, which is the first time we come back, which is, you know, we did something and we ended up here at x2, and we compute the value of that function. So that's now a map. This is not a differential flow anymore, and obviously we can do it. So uh, what used to be a periodic orbit which pierced the section four times in oriented way, now is just four points. And uh, we think of the time in between is integer. If you ever need to return to the real problem, we will use the return time, which is the correct time for continuous flow. So now the problem is very s much simplified. All this spaghetti structure is gone, and we're just seeing how the pieces of spaghetti are glued together. And how do we do that? Well, there is a simple way, which is if you look at this figure here, and you look what happens at the end, you realize that every point that was here at, after one return is someplace else. So what you can do is you can construct a map of distance along this strange attractor, as it turns out, at time n, and on the vertical axis we will draw the distance at time n plus 1, where I land after one return. That's called a return map. And this return map is actually quite interesting. It's very simple. So it says, if I started someplace at this end, so this is close to equilibrium point, which is unstable, then what happens after one iterate, I started four, I ended up at six and a half, let's say, which means I'm <coughs> going away. So there's a whole bunch of points on the initial line which are close to the equilibrium, and they just get pushed away. Then there is a very important point called critical point, which is as far as I can reach. I cannot, <coughs> I have no value higher than that, so this is the last point and this point will be at the edge of the iteration at next time. And then here comes the thing that we saw. This whole interval here, this whole interval has a negative slope, which means that points which were further away are now closer and closer. So it means in meeting we went like this, and then this half is now folded over. So things which were far, these guys here, far, they end up being very close after one iteration. So the operation is stretch and fold, stretch and fold. Now, this is not a particularly good Poincaré section. Uh, I just used the radial distance of the trajectory, the piercing. Uh, Poincaré section is two-dimensional, not one-dimensional. I will discuss how to do this better. And because it's not very good, this section, you know, it can be weird, so we just show you a few examples. If I use B and C sections from before, uh, you know, this or that one to construct a return map, I get something, but it's nonsensical. It is either kind of multi-valued and complicated. You see it's double-valued in here. You know, if I, <coughs> I have two values that uh, initial point has, but that's not a function, or it's even worse in this case. So we will fix that, but you just get the main idea here. 
So now the question that anybody with any sense of rigor would ask, is this a strange attractor? It turns out, for reasons maybe that you understand later in this course, it's extremely hard to know whether something is a strange attractor. It's a difficult mathematical problem. We have beautiful mathematical theory in one dimension when our map goes from line back on, onto line. So there we know when it's strange attractor and when it's not and what do we mean by that. Even in two dimensions, the mathematical theory is quite weak. So there are lots of examples of strange attractors in when you have plane mapping into a plane where practical person would say, well, this is strange, but mathematically we have no way of proving it. And the reason for that is that it's very hard to describe the folding point. When you take your piece of dough, stretch it and fold it, what happens in this area is competition between compression this way and stretching, and that's actually very hard to do. But we are working people. So, for now we accept this is a strange attractor and there are, you know, good arguments why we can do this. As working people, either we don't need infinite precision or we know that there is noise and dynamics, so very weird little regions of state space which are not belonging to a strange attractor might get wiped out by the noise, so that's a general idea.